Thank you, Vince. Um, I'll have the first talk then. When I was writing it, when I was writing down the paper, I thought it was, it has different angles of it. It touches to um, the rural policy, but it's, it's not entire, but you will see it all fits nicely together. So I'll just walk you through it and then if you have questions, uh, I'll be here. This, this talk is on behalf of myself. So I'm Karel, work at the Flemish Land Agency, an agency of the, um, the Ministry of uh, Nature, Environment and uh, Energy. Um, and it's together with my colleague Erben Meilemans, who works at the Flemish Heritage Agency. Because as you will see, there's a lot of uh, things overlapping more and more next years and the last years to come. So um, we have a nice future together, I hope. And so that's what I will be talking about. Um, presentation, so it's first a bit about the legislation, the, the data sets we have uh, at our, um, available for the moment, how we, our projects and our work interests interact and how we can see uh, opportunities for both of them. And then I'll illustrate with some, uh, some examples and draw some conclusions. So the, recently in 2016, there was a new Heritage Act, which integrated the legislation that was uh, in place in, from the 30s on. You had a Monuments Act, a Landscape Act, and an Archaeology Act, and then they draw it all together in one new Heritage Act. Some new uh, items in it, important items in, in the story is that uh, they can now designate archaeological zones. So th these are zones, uh, areas where there's presumed high quality archaeological remains present. Um, so it's not the same as a scheduling. It's, it's really something with a scientific potential, say. Um, another new thing, very important, is that you need an archaeological, to make an archaeological assessment when you uh, are uh, applying a planning permission. Uh, if you have to do that, it depends on the nature of your development. If there's not much, uh, you're not doing a lot of uh, disturbance in the soil, you don't need it, but from some thresholds, you need to, uh, to make that. It depends on the location, of course. If it's on a scheduled site, you do it, have to do it anyway. And otherwise, it depends on whether it's in or outside an archaeological uh, zone. So if it's uh, bigger than 5,000 uh, square meter, or if you're an uh, official body organization, then uh, bigger than 3,000 square meters, and your impact of the development is more than 1,000 square meters, you have to make an archaeological assessment. And when it's inside an archaeological zone, then you almost always have to make this um, assessment. An assessment, it starts with a desktop. If the desktop shows clearly if there's no archaeology left there anymore, then that's OK. But if it shows there is a possibility, you have to make steps further and see how far you have to go to make sure you get your planning permission. Something new in the Heritage Act also is uh, they can now draw up heritage direction plans. I don't know really how to uh, translate that. It is a um, onroevend erfgoed richtplan, they call it in, in, in Dutch. So it's about which direction you should go with an area, with uh, something, which is a, a participative uh, project with all stakeholders involved in an area. It, uh, it's about a long-term vision. You, you have to think about 20 or, or more years. And you can uh, make an action program together with it. But of course, the problem, if you have an action program, you need money to do that and there's still some work to be done there and that's also where we as a Flemish land agency will tap into. We also had a, a new legislation for my uh, my department, my agency, so a new land development act. Um, what's new in there, we have a, a big toolkit now with different instruments. We used to have different regulations, but now it's all integrated. So a big toolkit with uh, nature development instrument, land consolidation, land use planning, land exchange, a land bank, the stewardship schemes, it's all in there. So if we have a project, you can use whatever tool you, you like. And so our main objective is to develop and manage the countryside. There are three tracks, we call them. I don't uh, really know how to uh, translate it otherwise three tracks. We have the, the real land development plans that my agency does, which is uh, financed by the Flemish government. That's our core business, say. On the other hand, you have a the track two is a development that we will do with on demand of another authority who has to 
make sure that there's financing for it also. And then there's a third track, which is about agreements and compensation for services, which is also on demand of some other authority. While this was happening, you had the new legislation and, and new, uh, new things happening. Of course, there are a lot of uh, data sets um, <coughs> available for the moment. We have a new uh, digital elevation model, which is uh, uh, available free for the entire part of Flanders. Uh, very high resolution, uh, more than 16 points square meter and sometimes even more. Of course, you have a lot of other data like the parcel registration of the um, agriculture department, potential erosion maps, uh, the policy maps where we have the European stewardship schemes or where we have uh, special attention, the Natura 2000, um, everything that is scheduled, the new archaeological um, designated zones, all the archaeological data. You can easily, when you have an interest in an area, can easily put on all these layers and have directly, you can see opportunities, uh, threats, to very, very easy. So that's also a way to, to raise the uh, profile of an area and to see uh, how people can, can start working together. And this is what I uh, will illustrate in a minute in a, with a few examples. So we see a lot of interaction and opportunities. So for instance, the Flanders uh, Heritage Agency can schedule an archaeological site or designate an archaeological zone. They can do it on their own behalf based on archaeological finds by uh, research, by uh, metal detecting, um, based on uh, DTM data, um, or even as sometimes uh, happens uh, when we do an archaeological research for one of our projects, we say, this is interesting. And then as a reaction, they designate or can schedule uh, the site. So we have a constant uh, interaction. Um, as I said, the designation um, has only an impact on the archaeological assessment, whether it is needed or not needed. Otherwise, there's no, uh, no legal uh, obligation uh, tied to that. Um, the scheduling as an archaeological site has, has more impact on uh, other authorities, but still you have no impact on the present land use. You cannot say to a farmer, you cannot plow anymore, or you cannot interfere with the normal uh, working of the, of the farmer. But when there is an overlap between archaeological zones or scheduled archaeological monuments with projects of my agency, then we do have these possibilities to do some land exchange, uh, to pay a compensation for services, to start up a special stewardship scheme, or to have the agri-environment uh, agreements, um, try to deploy them. Because, for instance, we have uh, agronomists working on my agency, and they can make an uh, analysis of the, the farming practice, uh, the, which farmers are active in which area, how big is their farm, what do they do? Do they have stock or not? Uh, well, cattle or not? And they can see how, how uh, an exchange of land can happen to rearrange parcels. So you can have another uh, land use on, on a certain area, for instance. And we have farm planners working for our agency who can then inform the farmers and try to convince them to do special stewardship scheme or to take up an agri-environment stewardship scheme, which is favorable for biodiversity and archaeology. Um, even when there's no overlap with projects my agency is running, there are still some possibilities. You still have the uh, agro-environment agreements where um, our farm uh, planners can, can assist uh, the heritage agency in, in trying to, uh, to deploy these. Um, we are thinking, well, we've been thinking for the last uh, 15 years already, I think, uh, to have a special heritage agreement and with the special um, designation of archaeological zones, of course, you have an extra burden in the, the planning process. So that might be some opening for us to have a, a, the ministry agreeing with a, a special heritage agreement to compensate the extra burden that farmers have when they need a, an archaeological assessment uh, in their planning processes. Um, and also, as I told before, when Flanders Heritage uh, wants to start up an heritage direction plan, 
they can activate the third track where you can have agreements and compensation for services. But then, of course, there's the, the question of the financing. But the instrument, the, the, the framework and the toolkit is at least available. I'll uh, try to illustrate these uh, points I made in, in a few examples. Uh, recently, the Heritage Agency um, designated um, an archaeological zone for um, band, uh, linear uh, band ceramic sites, Neolithic sites. In, uh, it's in the um, Limburg part of uh, Flanders, the eastern part, where uh, the landscape is more undulating, uh, where you have uh, erosion uh, phenomena. Yeah, the, you know, the band ceramics. This is one of the sites you have a, a a, s a small, well, you have a plateau, but it's sl slightly sloping, so we have a lot of erosion uh, taking place on these uh, these fields. This is what you see here. These are the potential erosion maps. So every farmer, when he gets his yearly uh, parcel uh, registration uh, papers, he can see what the erosion, potential erosion of his fields are, and then he directly knows if he has to uh, take some special measures or not. So you see it, it goes from uh, purple, which is a uh, very high erosion, to green. So you see there's a lot of uh, reddish colors here, so a lot of erosion uh, taking place. This is the ordinary parcel registration, where you see that a lot of these, while they are uh, erosive parcels, they still have uh, corn on it, or uh, uh, grains, uh, even sugar beets, which are very unfavorable for um, erosion, of course. If you see an overlap with the, the management plans we have for uh, farm birds and hamsters, for instance, um, you directly see that there's an interest, an overlapping interest in these areas. So it means our uh, farm planners can go there and, uh, and try to uh, put in the agri-environment uh, agreements. Um, so we hope with, with in, in this case, that we can have a special heritage stewardship scheme for grassland on archaeological uh, sites, archaeological designations. Um, but we can also try to activate track two or three, where we have a stewardship scheme, specially uh, designed for the management of these archaeological sites, where we try to take <coughs> archaeology and biodiversity um, into account and, and protect both. Um, or we can try to uh, compensate farmers for services for the management of these archaeological sites. Um, important here is that the agri-environment stewardship schemes are only limited in time, of course, but the other agreements and compensation for services, you can have them for a longer, longer period, as long as you have the finances for it, of course, which is every time. Um, um, second example, I'll be quickly with this one. This is a... Um, <coughs> Uh, land consolidation project, reallotment. It's uh, an area near Brussels. Brussels is a bit here to the to the east. Um, it's also it's also an undulating landscape. It's called the Bijlderland. Very nice region. Come to Flanders, make sure you you visit it. Here you have um, the Roman road going, and here on the southern part you have uh, we already knew from uh, previous prospections. Uh, field walking that there is a Roman Vicus uh, situated there. So um, for our project, we really wanted to know how big is this Vicus and, and what's, what are the qualities uh, still there. So we make a, a big magnetometry uh, geophysical uh, prospection. So we have uh, over 20 hectares uh, scanned with it. We have a lot of, you see all the, the Roman houses uh, with the backyards where the um, industry was taking place. You have a, somewhere here there, there's traces of a temple, so it's, it's really it's a unique archaeological site. Um, so then we gave all our data to the Heritage Agency and then they scheduled it. So now it's a, a scheduled archaeological site. Um, but as you see, the, the really the core area uh, of, of six he hex hectares uh, of the heart of the, the Vicus, which is still in agricultural use. Um, you have uh, still corn and sugar beets uh, growing, so it's, it's, it's not likely to be there for a very long time. So we are thinking that we should do something with it. 
Um, these are the erosion maps and the, the, the parcel registration maps. So what we are thinking of doing in this case is that in our project we can rearrange the parcels and so we can try to impose the land use that fits the archaeology best and fits the farmer best. And at the same time, we will try to uh, legally fix the land use for the future. And then we can also compensate the owner for the easement of it. So you, it's, it's OK to find a farmer who's willing to have uh, grassland there. But of course, when he stops and a new uh, user comes, you cannot let it turn back to normal agricultural use. So we can use uh, this compensation for the owner to pay him for the, the restrictions on his land. Um, other possibilities, the environmental agreements, uh, maybe put flower meadows there or farm uh, bird crops, but of course temporary agreement for the long term. But then we can use the instrument, but we cannot uh, finance it. And unfortunately, the heritage agency cannot either. Um, so that we have to try to find some other possibilities or we can design and develop the area. Um, to evacuate the Roman Vicus, for instance, and then pay uh, somebody, uh, a nature organization, for instance, or somebody else to uh, manage the area. But then, of course, there's the same thing. Who will finance this? Last example, another possibility, um, also a recent uh, discovered uh, site, well, recent a few years ago, with a large uh, high density DTM. You see these uh, Celtic fields. Um, uh, visible here, uh, which look more or less like this, you know, the fields 40 by 40 meters more or less, which are still preserved there. Um, we, well, the Heritage Agency did some uh, some research there and have very nice results. And we should also try to protect them and to have uh, a good management for that. But as you see here, this is not in agricultural use, but it's in forestry, where you can have the same problem. So maybe here the possibility of a compensation for services to harvest it with respect for the archaeology or not harvest areas or leave it more open or whatever but there are some uh, some possibilities there too quickly some conclusions so the we see many possibilities for management of archaeological uh, areas uh, when combining the heritage agencies and our uh, instrument problem is of course always the same who will pay for this and then in some cases, of course, uh, rural development plans or CAP is a way to help fund this, but drawback limited in time. You can only pay farmers uh, with this uh, European money and you have very strict procedures and control in place. Uh, so farmers are quite reluctant if you would. Uh, on the other hand, you have this 50% or even more, maybe sometimes uh, European co-financing. The farmers already, they know the, the the instrument very well and you can hitchhike with the existing procedures and administrations working on that so it's a bit yeah you have to, to balance things and see how it goes for the moment when I, I think of it if you want to really have for the long term it might be a better option to uh, have the farm advising financed with the European uh, funding and then try to find financing for the other instruments another uh, Another possibility and, and, and uh, an engagement of the Flemish authorities then to have the, the real instrument uh, deployed in the field. Then. That was it, I think. Yes. Okay, thank Sorry, you so well, slightly. I mean, Henry's having a tight two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. In that case, I'll go back and. <laughs> thank you very much.